For almost 100 years, Billericay's football team was one of countless thousands of small local clubs in England. Something happened in 1969 that was to put Billericay on the footballing map forever. By the late 1970s, Wembley would ring with the sound of thousands of Billericay fans in full voice. The coveted FA Vars would come home to New Lodge on three occasions in four years. This is the incredible story of what some dubbed Billericay's annual trip to Wembley, told by the men who became heroes. Doug Young, striker. Freddie Clayton, striker. My name is Jeff Hazlitt, I play with number eight. I'm John Pullin, uh, I'm a defender. My name's Arthur Cofton, I was a sweeper. John Newman, the manager of the Ricky Town Football Club. In this film, we will bring back forgotten footage from the original 16mm film captured by Rank, original radio sound recordings and colourised photographs never seen before. Billericay are never dull. The club nestles down Bluntswell Road and continues to enjoy success, feeling very much like the 1970s once more. That is to say, winning a treble, four-figure attendances, Lots of goals, exciting twists and turns, and songs at full throttle. The Billericay Town team of the late 1960s were training and playing at Archer Hall on Langdon Road on a muddy, unenclosed pitch. What was the ground like in those days to look at and to play on? Well, it was, uh, again, Archer Hall. It was a bog. Um, it was a slope from one goal to the other. It was tough. Dreadful. But John hadn't had a time to improve on the ground, but uh, he certainly worked on it with players. It was a mud heap, basically. The, uh, everyone knows where Archer Hall is anyway in Billericay, and they probably realised that, uh, that it has a slope on it. So one end of the pitch used to, used to get very wet and the other end used to get even wetter. We used to do the training Tuesdays and Thursdays and we had four chairs, four chairs from the clubhouse. I don't think cones were invented then, but we had these four chairs and we used to run around these four chairs and the only light we had was from the street lights on the main road. That's how it all started. The players' individual journeys up the Wembley steps can be directly traced back to the childhood kickabouts. My father played in goal for Portsmouth, um, and obviously, naturally, uh, uh, he encouraged me to start kicking the football down in, in, in the garden and in the fields, and uh, I guess it was, yeah, sort of uh, when I was four or five years old. Uh, in the back garden, uh, on the concrete, my boots with wooden studs in. Uh, that's where I learned everything, out in the back garden. On Blackheath, South London, we used to have a pitch across the road from the house. So I was very lucky, you know, I used to see Sunday morning football there. I never played for any kind of youth club or, or anything like that, so it would literally be uh, down the side of the house and then some garages or over, over the the back of the garden wall where there was a field with, with friends. In the streets around Harold Hill, um, quite a few friends used to stick up a couple of coats, like most kids in that, that era, um, kick the ball on the village on the uh, green. Normally quite a lot of dog's poo, which uh, used to get on the clothes and that, but that never put us off. Yeah, a very tender age. I've always been massively in, involved in sport. Uh, cricket was my favourite sport at one stage, but um, I've always been a student of sport. John Newman's arrival as manager changed everything. John was organised, ahead of his time, and had the formula for success. 
I was bald boy when England played Hungary in 1953. And it's like they come from a different planet. You know, their football was so superior and sophisticated that um, I wanted a, that sort of prompted me. I had no ambition really to be a manager, but I was so inspired with this style of football that I thought it might be worth a try. Skipper Arthur Coughlin was John Newman's main man and voice and earned respect from the players for his captaincy and outright ability. Arthur, brilliant, you know, outstanding leader, um, always in control, um, not fearful or intimidated by anything, but played the ball, very good distribution, very calm, wonderful player. Arthur was a leader. Um, we was all, everybody was respectful of Arthur, what he said, we did, and he was, he was John's man out on the park. Arthur, what can you say about a legend? The man's a gentleman, a pleasure to know, a pleasure to play with. He was just uh, exceptional, it says everything about the club, the person. Well, he's a, he's a skipper of uh, a great delight to uh, to work for. He, he encouraged everyone. He managed to speak to everyone. I played with Arthur at Hornchurch, um, and he uh, uh, he was just a person to get the team together and motivate them. Arthur was the captain. Um, he was the, if you like, the elder statesman of the of the team. Arthur helped me a lot when, when I was first at Billericay as a, as a young lad. Um, he would occasionally talk to me after, after training and things like that. And as I, as I got older, um, I, I would not say I tried to model myself on Arthur, but certainly playing with him with, for all those years, something rubs off. You watch, you watch somebody cool under pressure, somebody trying to play the ball out constructively, uh, whenever they can, but really not taking any chances if they if they don't need to. Couldn't hit a ball, but could read a game fantastically well and would always be there. At the end of the season of the first FA Vars, Arthur was set to retire, but was convinced to stay just one more year, resulting in him lifting the Vars again. He was a popular figure. With 275 goals, Fred Clayton is still the all-time record goal scorer for town. Fred's partnerships with Jeff Aslett and Doug Young were a delight and would see town chalk up many, many historic victories. Great striker, great player, created things for other people, worked hard, and just a pleasure to play with. He just always scored goals, you know, he'd be dependable. Freddie was uh, a legend because uh, I could rely on Fred being the faster of the two up front. Um, and as long as I got the ball in front of him, then goal was the word. Fred was more than that. M was more than just an out there goal scorer. Fred would drop back into midfield. He was a playmaker. Um, occasionally he would do some work as well. Um, some defending, not very often. But then you wouldn't want him to do that. Fred was, uh, I, I, I used to look up to Fred. Fred was a, was a very, very good player. Freddie, yeah, I saw, played against Freddie. So as a player, I knew how good it was, and I had to work, as Freddie's pointed out, I had to work very, very hard to get him here, to get him to the club. But it was, a, it was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, he's proved to be a great hero here, a, a legend as a goal scorer, and a fantastic player. Done a great job for the club. Six foot two target man, Jeff Aslett, was a giant up front for the club and had a keen eye for goal. He struck fear into the hearts of defences, who had their work cut out marking him. Other players also benefited from Jeff's presence. Jeff was was great for me personally because it was like going out there onto the field of play with a minder. And nobody could touch me. If they did, then Jeff would give them a, a clump. As he. He's a lump, wasn't he? Yeah. Very hard, good player. 
knock the ball up to, bring it down, bring other people into the game. Lacked pace, but it didn't matter because it could score goals with his head, knock a 30 yarder in. Jeff was a typical old fashioned centre forward. If you played a ball up to Jeff, you would know that it would stick, he would control the ball and look to, to bring other players in. Um, he was possibly not the most mobile of, of players, but he didn't need to be because that wasn't his job. He was good in the air, he had two good feet, he had a good shot uh, on him. Um, and you could you could rely that rely on Jeff that uh, he could take care of himself as well. Yeah, Jeff was um, a big target man. Would be intimidated. He was. Um, I wanted everybody to play football. We were out there to play football, but prior to Jeff's arrival, we only had one player that was a deterrent, and um, that player was Mike Payne, a bit of an unsung hero for me. Versatile defender John Pullin, or JP, came through the youth system and played for no other club. A true blue, at 418 appearances, no one has pulled on the town shirt more than John. John has one other remarkable record. He scored town's very first goal in the FA Cup. John was, yeah, a quite unsung hero, really. He was such a good athlete, so level-headed, so disciplined. We played man-to-man -man marking, so we had outstanding defence. JP was our best man marker. Um, again, along with Mickey Payne. Um, but JP, if there was a danger man up front, John would say, uh, JP, you pick up this guy. Here's your man, don't leave him. And, and John would be tremendous at, at man marking someone out of the game and now and again he did get down the line and he, he did score twice I think in 15 or 17 years that he was here so he, he, he does know roughly where the goal is I barely saw him because he was too quick it was a blur um, and I used to just hope that once he got down the wing uh, I could then focus on the ball and then yeah I would invariably try and knock it down for Fred, who was always alongside me, um, and we would score. JP, brilliant, reliable, dependable, scored a goal every 400 games. He was just different class, really. Doug Young was a goal grabber and was Town's fox in the box. Stylish to watch, Doug even had a trial for Spurs in which he scored. Doug was an instant hit with fans as soon as he joined from local rivals Brentwood. The best goal scorer, and I'm, uh, I'm now thinking Jake is a tremendous goal scorer as well here at the moment, but Dougie was the best goal scorer Billericay have ever had. Dougie, special. Yeah, very talented player. So unfortunate with his injury that he's had a shortened career. But Christ, he made his mark in that very short time, didn't he? So uh, another legend won't be forgotten, hat-trick at Wembley. Only the second man to do that. So, unique. I think Arsene Wenger once said that what Arsenal needed was a fox in the box. And I think that's what young he was to, to Billericay. Um, Doug scored most of his goals inside the box. Um, and some of them were, were typical goals that you would expect a striker uh, to get. He was uh, he, he would be in the right place at the right time. Uh, but Doug used to do his share, fair share of work as well. Um, so he, certainly, he certainly wasn't lazy on the pitch, um, but a, an extraordinary player, Doug. Dougie would be always there. I mean, he wouldn't hit a ball from 20, 30 yards. I don't, think, I don't think he's ever scored from 20 or 30 yards in all the time he's been playing. Um, <laughs> one, was it? <laughs> OK, I missed it. <laughs> oh, yeah, the one at Wembley. I forgot about that. <laughs> the players, unlike some today, had to rely upon a profession outside football. When we moved down to New Lodge here, the there was no money. But... 
What does stick in my memory is the when we, after a game, we would be sitting in that changing room and you'd get a few of the supporters that could afford it bringing in a tenner, 20, fives. And I used to look after that for the chaps and um, we used to put it behind the bar and have a drink and that's, that's all we got. I didn't really get paid an awful lot. Uh, some boot money, um, but it, uh, it was the stars of the team that, that uh, got paid, not the defenders. Uh, what we did get paid in them days, five, ten pounds, whatever it was, just went straight back over the bar. So that was it really. It was a pleasure to play for nothing. Anything else was a bonus. I didn't get any pay because uh, I was okay and John, we had a very minimal budget and uh, we managed to utilise it for the guys who could do with a little bit more money. I did take the two bonuses when we won the, uh, the final because it was a, you know, you should take that because everyone's got that. So that was great, but no, I wasn't interested in pay, playing for money really. The fans after the, after the games used to have what's, what was called a whip and they used to put it behind the bar for the players' drinking facility. And that was done nearly, nearly all the season. And they were um, very, very loyal to us and we were loyal to them back. And the relationship with the fans was and still is, I believe, marvellous. Fantastic here. How did you manage with the work football balance? Well, I lived in Hatton. I worked in Hatton. I was a loom operator. That was it, really, stitching trampoline beds. Lived at Harold Hill. Worked as a, a cutter, dressing gown cutter, at Gallows Corner. So the travel, the distance was probably 25 minutes through the country lanes to this club. Um, as far as work and football, it was quite easy because we didn't have big distances to travel. Um, later on in my career, I, I was um, very, very busy at work. But strangely enough, I always managed to be able to get away on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Um, which was training nights. So I, I found it really not a problem at all. That was pretty easy. I worked in the city. I was um, I, I played for the Stock Exchange. I was captain of the Stock Exchange football team. And uh, I worked in the city, so it was, I was commuting really. And my job, um, I was, my job facilitated me playing and training here with no trouble at all. I was living in Wyatt's Green, uh, Doddinghurst, which is just only 15, 20 minutes from, from the ground here. Um, but I was working all round because construction takes you uh, wherever the construction industry wants you to do something. Um, so it wasn't too bad uh, because being sort of the owner of the company, I used to be able to work out when I needed to be here and be there. And that's, that's how it all sort of worked. So it did gel okay. Can you remember who the rivals were in the league during your spell? Um, many rivals. Um, Asen was the, the most lo local team uh, because uh, being only down the road and they used to raise their game because most of the boys in our team knew the boys in the Basildon team but you know they were never up to scratch for us really and I, I think our record probably was well into the 90% uh, so uh, it was always a great battle. The Battle of Basildon and Billericay was always uh, renowned, I think, in the, in the South End Echo or Gazette, whatever they call it. Like everybody else, I vaguely remember that we couldn't stand the sight of Basildon Town. <laughs> so, um, we got, had some friends there, but uh, there was massive rivalry between the two clubs. Um, well, the obvious big rivals were Basildon. He, uh, yes, as we as, as we went up through from the Olympic League and into senior football, Basildon came along with us. Um, so they were our rivals for a good number of years. It's most of the guys at Basildon I I knew 
um, since we were kids. Um, most of them were my age, most of them were uh, school friends as well. So that was even more of a, a rivalry as far as I was concerned. Yeah, probably the first season in our Olympian League days would be Chadwell Heath, which were an excellent side. Um, and, and since then, a few of their players did come and play for Billericay as well. Um, but they were a very, very good side. And I think we had to win our last lot of games from Christmas to actually win the league. We had to win every game and, and fair play to the chaps, they did it. In those days, we were in the Athenian League, so mostly Greys, Wingate, Leighton, Edgware. There's all hard games, but we had a good side. Cope well and won everything. Brentwood. Brentwood were a, a good side in the early days as well. They had some very good players and Dougie played for them at that particular time. Um, well, they probably they didn't have as many good players. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I think later, <clears throat> later on, I think Farnborough became rivals. Even though, even though we only ever played them twice while while we were there, anyway. Um, I think just the fact that it was in the Vars that they kind of came, be, be, you know, became rivals. Well, the. the... The big matches for me, the outstanding matches, were the Farnborough games the boys have already referred to. They were the, the best team, the best team we played against in my time here. They were so well prepared and uh, we, as one of the chaps has already said, we learnt a lot from them. They had the resources, we didn't have resources here. We, we won so much without resources, so a great credit to the boys. The one game which was the best game that I thought that meant a lot to me was when we beat Waltham Stowe Avenue in the FA Cup 3-1. Uh, I was winged on non-league football. I think I had a trial at Waltham Stowe when I was 15. And my father said I couldn't sign for him because they swore too much. But uh, that meant a lot to me. Nearly 3,000 people here. Managed to score a goal as well. So it was a great day, it meant a lot. So take me through a typical match day from, from waking up, breakfast, etc. There was no real set preparation for me. I used to get up, looked so, so forward to playing. That's all I thought about all week, was playing football for Billericay. Have a bacon sandwich or something play with the kids, watch Football Focus or whatever it was there, St and Greavesy I think it was at that time. And then couldn't wait to get here, up to the club, to listen to Arthur's latest joke. Match day was really no, no different um, than any other day. Um, I would have breakfast. Uh, if I had things to do, then I would do them. Um, and then we would normally meet before, before the match. Um, if it was an away match, we would meet obviously earlier on. So depending on really uh, what time we were supposed to meet, it, uh, you know, made, made my choice of what I did in the morning. Up breakfast, play with the kids, drove to the ground, always got here early, and our team talked and just went on, done our business. Did you keep relatively fit for town? Very lucky, as I didn't tackle very much, I didn't get injured much. So uh, most of the time I was not injured at all. The whole time I was here, hardly ever injured. It's something I was born with, dysplasia of the hips, like Trandellenburg deficiency it's called. I used to run, I used to kick myself, my right foot would kick my left ankle. Um, but I had a few injuries, got done in a senior cup final. Uh, deliberately and ripped my ligaments. And next day we played the Gold Diggers. We had Elton John down here and a few others, so I missed all that. Uh, done my knee ligaments once as well. But other than that, everything was fine. Very lucky with injuries. Uh, in the early days, hardly any. 
uh, in latter years, as you get older, I suffer with hamstrings quite a bit. Um, but, but that was all very, very lucky with injuries. Um, I probably only ever got one, one bad injury, which was uh, I tore my cartilage uh, in 1976, which, uh, which was probably, it was probably about round four of the VARs. I didn't, didn't do it in a, in a match, I did actually do it in training. The FA VARs was a competition in its infancy in the 1970s. This non-league knockout competition took over from the Amateur Cup of 1893 and sat under the FA Cup for the professional clubs and FA Trophy for the amateur elite. Bill Rickey's impressive 1976 FA Vars campaign would see Town only concede three goals. It started away to Hatfield Town. That was expected to be a goal fest, but it saw Town nearly slip up at the first hurdle with a 1-1 draw, Tony Wakefield opening Bill Rickey's account. The replay at New Lodge saw Town overcome Hatfield 2-0, with both goals coming from Freddie Claydon. In the second round, a lacklustre display netted a 2-0 away victory at Crown and Manor, with Geddes and Smith making the difference. A tougher test in round three saw Aslett's goal beat an inform Epping in front of a 400-plus crowd. Round four's home match against City of Norwich Old Boys Union saw a dominant attacking town win 2-1 with Aslett and Claydon grabbing the goals. Hungerford were brushed aside on a perilous frozen pitch 2-0 at New Lodge in round five with goals from Claydon and Smith. Jeff Aslett would have a lasting memento. Someone unbeknown to me must have put their studs up against my shin pad and threw my sock shin pad when I went into the dressing room at the end of the game. He beat Hunger for 2 0 that day, I think. Uh, and I thought, oh, my leg's bleeding. Round six, quarter finals. Town took on Cadbury Heath away. It saw Town chanted on by 350 travelling Billericay supporters and then win by three goals to nil. Wakefield grabbed a late first half opener with who else but the telepathic pairing of Claydon and Aslett to seal the deal. Wembley, perhaps, for the first time, was within grasp. Brilliant, Wakey scored the first goal. Uh, I think I scored the second goal and Jeff scored the, the third goal. And we were that, and it wasn't until that game that I ever thought about Wembley. Now we're in the semi-final because a team like Billericay Town don't go to Wembley. The semi-finals were to be against the well-respected giants of non-league, Farnborough Town. In front of a record crowd of 3,193 spectators, Billericay won a hard-fought first leg by two goals to one. Steve Bones scoring with an early header. Comes right over now, Ted it up there, goes forward, and it's there! Oh, Clayton's second half goal was to be decisive. Uh, of the semi-final of the FA Vegas match, uh, in Billericay is Billericay Town 2, Farnborough Town 1. What about next week? How do you see that? It's got to be tight again, isn't it? The away leg against a Farnborough that hadn't lost at home in 60 matches was to be a nail-biting, pressure-filled, torrid affair. Steve Bone, John Pullin and Lester Foreman, backed by a very sharp Steve Griffiths, fought off an almost unrelentless attack, especially in the second half, to deny Farnborough payback. The nil-nil draw earned Town a trip to Wembley for the very first time in their history. Players and fans mobilised to Wembley Stadium on the 10th of April 1976 and dared to dream. Preparations had begun. from other games and other finals would be in and I wanted it, be, it to be kept at the same level. I didn't want to make it that special. One of the things that I'd sort of picked up on, being a student of the game as I 
was and still am, was that Wembley teams crumble because of the pressure. They can't cope with it. They're good till they get to Wembley. And I was so keen that, that we weren't going to be exposed to that. It was a great experience to have all this in front of us. Our imagination is telling us what it's going to be like. Waking up is just normal. I just didn't, you know, I, I'm a great sleeper. I'm still a great sleeper now. Um, so when I woke, I woke. Uh, breakfast. And uh, there was a buzz and a uh, little bit of motivation from John starting at probably nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, and the skipper, he was, uh, he was as bad. Um, and we just jumped on the coach and off we went. That was when you suddenly realised that, that we were there. I think when uh, the, the, the time I realised was when we, we, we pulled along Wembley Way. And if you look down the, down the coach, you could see the Twin Towers in front of you with the flags flying. Um, then you knew, you knew you were there then. That was, uh, that, that was actually a great feeling. Well, the whole of Wembley Way was littered with Dillericke fans. So we were made quite welcome by the fans. And, and by the time we were coming out on the pitch, the whole area was littered with Dillericke fans. It felt like they were all in blue and white. You see the supporters, you see the blue and white, you see the banners, and then you pull round in the coach, go round to the side of the stadium, and you get out and the side door opens, and we all walk through and into this massive dressing room, absolutely massive dressing room, where we've got the locker each. Well, we'd never been used to that lockers each. Sometimes we had to put our clothes on the same peg. Oh, well, every, every, every person, every footballer's dream, whether you're an amateur, amateur footballer or a, a pro, you know, there's quite a few friends of mine who've been pros. They've never been to Wembley. Um, so, yeah, that's how, uh, that's how tremendous it is. Wembley's uh, staff made us very welcome. So we came out onto the pitch and all we could see was our blue and white. It was just absolutely outstanding. It was brilliant. If I remember rightly, the, the, uh, the, the tunnel um, sloped. So when you were at the bottom, you couldn't really see anything other than the sky and the top of the stand. And as you, as you came up the, the tunnel, then more and more came into, into view. And then all of a sudden you were, you were out in, in the sunshine. Absolutely cheering, jumping up and down underneath me. And the teams are coming towards the middle of the pitch. John Newman has been shown by one of the stewards to stand by the edge of the pitch with his team. Arthur Cosman, the fourth. At that stage, that, that looks one of the most wonderful things that you're ever going to see in football. And you're walking up that tunnel and it's all opening up in front of you. And then there's the crowd there as well. There's this soft grass that you walk on. And you're with your mates and you're just looking around and up in amazement and how lucky we are to be able to do this. Tough game. I thought maybe I'm a bit biased, but I thought we were the better side, although we didn't play that well. Uh, I remember getting cramp 
And I only got cramped because I've seen professional footballers get cramped there before. So I thought I'd better get it. I don't think I played very well at all at Wembley. I was too nervous. I think there's probably probably two two memories that uh, that, that stand out. Uh, the first one was was myself, um, the guy I had to mark, um, and I overlapped. I can't remember who passed me the ball, but I cut inside him and, and hit a left foot shot, which is unusual for me. Uh, and it just cleared the bar. I actually thought it was. I actually thought it was going in. And we met our match. They were a very good side, and we sort of cancelled each other out a bit. So neither team was able to dominate. But they were up for it. They weren't a bad side. You know, they were a very good side, and they matched us. And we just edged it, and I think we just deserved it. So we didn't play our best football, but credit to them. They didn't allow us to. Stanford had seemed to have done their homework, and at 90 minutes, no one had made a decisive breakthrough. Scott, uh, but uh, Scott doesn't race four. They're not reading the game. They're looking a bit tired. They're looking a bit jaded. And who can blame them? Tired legs, team talk on the pitch. The time to dig deep for a goal had come. And it came. The historic moment came just nine minutes into extra time. It was a bit of a, we counteracted each other. Um, and uh, so it was a bit of a battle and got to extra time. Oh, I remember Jeff's goal, which was a relief more than, more than anything else. Gary Smith laid a perfect ball off and I still remember hitting it. And it uh, was better than Harry Kane and all them Tottenham mob that score there now. So uh, yeah, that was enough for us. And, uh, is our win. Out there onto the right wing now to outside left Smith and Smith is coming inside. Oh, pulled under control, a chance for it. He's in! That's the goal! Right, right, Jeff Aslett, who's got that ball? Oh, he controlled that oh, ball God. brilliantly there. He held on to it, drew the ball back away, and then slid the ball past the goalkeeper, Kevin Johnson, oh, after nine minutes in this. Nine minutes in this first half of extra time. The player who, of course, tried to hold off the inside right, Jeff Hasler, of Little Town, is lying prostrate on the edge of the box. And there we see go up on this beautiful electric scoreboard there, Little Town 1, the goal coming from inside forward, Jeff Hasler. Stamford nil. That, of course, is Aslett's fourth goal in this FA Vars Challenge competition. It's Bill Ricky Town. And yes, there you are here. Without a doubt, I no need to tell you who that is. That's Bill Ricky Town. We want two. We want two. And who knows, they could well get it. That was the best. And yes, there it is. There is the referee's whistle. Players, they just collapsed. We're celebrating and cheering and getting together and hugging each other. But but sad that we didn't play as well as we could do. Well, I was thinking I'd never play here again um, at the time and uh, never realising that it was, was going to come back again. But at the time, I was just absolutely knocked out by the fans and the, the you know, the, just the, just the way the Billericay fans backed us, you know, to the hill, you know, it's just quite amazing. Personally, I was disappointed that I hadn't scored because I was disappointed every game I didn't score anyway. So it would have been nice, you know, to play at Wembley and score. But it wasn't to be, but the, the, the booby prize, if you like, was um, we won. And that was more important than personal achievements. No, the, the Wembley one was special because I think we've realised it puts you in history. I mean, we were doing pretty well until Wembley. But it elevates the whole situation, Wembley. It's a bit unfair, really. It's not. I didn't think it's that special. I mean, don't get me wrong, 
wonderful get there. And if we hadn't have got there, you'd look at the career and say, well, you didn't get to Wembley. So, yeah, good in that respect. But all the other, nothing was easy. Nothing was easy. The first competition we won, the Olympia, we won by goal difference. You know, I think we won the last eight games without conceding a goal. So, how tough was that? I felt absolutely honoured to be representing Billericay Town there and collecting the bars. You know, it was quite a, quite a moment. Like the previous season, Billericay started their campaign very shakily at home against a Swanley town, Aslett and Woodhouse scoring extra time goals from Phil Wettles' perfectly flighted free kicks. Next up were Hoddesdon Town, again at home on a shocking pitch, but a very much more comfortable win of 4-1, Wakefield, Claydon, Foreman and Wettle all scoring for town. Round four saw Town stutter to a nil-nil draw with Redhill, only to beat them in extra time at the replay at New Lodge, 3-1. A second half goal from Tony Wakefield had seemed to have won it, but with a minute to go, Redhill got the equaliser from the spot. Extra time goals from Bone and Aslett saw us progress through. Round five saw Town up against Armansbury Greenway in the FA Vars for the very first time, tying 2-2. From being two goals down after 22 minutes, Aslett and Claydon salvaged the replay from the worst performance to date in the Vars. In the home replay against Armensbury Greenway, Town seemed to have learnt valuable lessons and notched up an impressive Vars record victory of 6-2, with Wettle, Scott and Wakefield on a score sheet including the hat-trick for an on-form Billy Woodhouse. Winterton Rangers in the quarters was a close affair, Town once again walking the tightrope with a 1-0 home win with Woodhouse excelling once more, grabbing the 92nd minute winner. I actually thought that they were one of the best teams we ever played in the bars, and I thought we were actually quite lucky to, uh, to, to win that match. I think if we, hadn't, if we hadn't have beaten them, I think they would have gone on, on to Wembley and won the bars that year. In a rematch of the previous year, Farnborough were again drawn with a home match for the first leg to try to get revenge for the previous year's exit. And that they did, getting their noses two goals to the good despite Billericay matching them and setting up a classic match at New Lodge in front of 3,078 fans. They came here, we, we had, we, we saw them come on the coach, the players saw them come in and they're all dressed in grey flannels, white shirts, blazers, ties. And us players looked at each other and thought, 
We're in for problems here. Cometh the hour, cometh the men. In a dramatic match which was punctuated with snow showers, Farnborough were truly taken apart 6-0 in the perfect performance. It would go down in history. Ricky McQueen's hat-trick, one scored directly from a corner, and a brace from Jeff Aslett and a goal from Freddie Clayton was a massive feat of strength and pride. We finished up 6-0 winners and that was phenomenal when you considered the game that they'd put together at uh, Farnborough and the way we recovered to win 6-2 on aggregate. Well, it is the Farnborough one. It is the Farnborough one because I knew them so well. We, they were our biggest rivals, but our biggest friends. And in actual fact, I mean, amazingly, one of the big things that we needed with our style of play was a good scout. We always had to know how the opposition were playing so that we would set up accordingly. And um, Colin Saul was our chief scout here and did a fantastic job. The 1977 final was against Sheffield, the oldest team in the country, dating back to 1857. Second year was a bit better because we'd experienced it. The second year, I personally went round and took more in. I went and looked at the corner flags. I went and looked at the goal nets. I went and looked at the goal posts, how the nets were attached to the posts. Because it's something I'd regretted not doing the first time round. Billericay Town failed to be emphatic once more at Wembley. Arthur Coughlin, who was set to retire the year before but added one more season, was to get an unwelcomed bit of misfortune in the 13th minute, slicing a speculative cross into his own net. Have I scored an own goal? <laughs> yeah, a dreadful error by me and I scored an own goal. And uh, it left me pretty down, but most of the boys were very generous to me and were telling me, to, you know, to push it away and get on. Um, I can only remember Arthur's own goal. Unfortunately for Arthur, um, I really don't remember much of that, that final at all. Fred Clayton would manage to salvage the match with a glorious header. A bit more satisfying because, because I scored. Um, and it, it wasn't a great goal. It, it, you know, I seemed to head the ball. The goalkeeper dived for it and it, I think it came off my shoulder rather than anything else. I looped up, so the goalkeeper had dived, but had gone too early because it, it took a ricochet off my shoulder. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a good goal at all, but it was an important goal. Um, and Arthur had, uh, you know, scored his own goal a little earlier. So it was nice to get a draw. Yeah, it was a bit stale. There was nothing really exciting there. Uh... I can't remember much of it really because I think you only remember winning, don't you? The match finished close on 6pm with both teams battling for 90 minutes, then 30 minutes of extra time, followed by an extraordinary 23 minutes of cramp-provoking injury time. What's extraordinary is the tired Wembley players would have no rest. They would have to go and battle once more the very next day at Crystal Palace Sports Centre, this time to compete for status changing floodlights. Only a win would bring the ground up to Athenian League standard with £7,500 worth of floodlights. And it allowed town to be voted in the next season, going on to win the league. We weren't our best on the day. We were very flat after the game, but we picked ourselves up fantastically to win the fighter side and the lights the following day, which was what a wonderful shows of the character of the team to do that. Only three days later was Wembley's replay in front of a dramatically smaller crowd at Nottingham Forest, a team at the top of English football at the time. 
it would see the deadlock finally broken, testing the endurance and stamina of the Billericay squad. The, the replay at Nottingham, again, was another place that we probably won't go and play at again. So it was nice to play there. With Brian Clough was the manager of Nottingham Forest and they were in their heyday at that, that particular time. And that was a, a marvellous experience because, again, we, we won. Aslett's powerful drive from 18 yards into the top corner on 15 minutes and Billy Woodhouse's bundling in from a corner on 32 minutes both came in the first half where Town just about shaded it. Um, the ball bounced fairly quite a distance out and I, uh, the second goal I swung my left foot at it and it, it was one of those that absolutely uh, hit it pure true. Nothing like a golf club these days, I wish I could hit a golf club as true as I hit that. And it just fizzled into the top corner from a, a good distance out. Well, I thought, I thought we actually beat them 2-1. I thought we were far better than that. Uh, in fact, I don't think we were ever in trouble against them. We were up for it. You know, we picked up sufficient from the first game to probably impose ourselves. As, you know, we've already said, I think we deserved it. All the finals were very close. You know, we didn't win in great style, but we won deservedly. And yeah, we had an extraordinary extraordinary few days where we, we played at Wembley on the Saturday, we played at Crystal Palace uh, on the following day where we won the, the floodlights and then three days later we, we then played the, the uh, replay final at Nottingham and won that and I think those three days were a massive, massive achievement um, for a club like Billericay. Three must-win matches in five days Town's legends had done the unimaginable. Despite no Wembley appearance for Town in 1978, it was, by all accounts, a most successful year for Town, bagging five trophies. Town's Vars campaign started with the crushing of Saffron Walden 5-2, Epping 3-1, Greys 2-1, and in the fifth round, faced a Barton Rovers side watched by a ground record 2,100 people. On an ice-rutted frozen pitch, with a gale blowing, an ever-resilient Barton dug deep and battled from 2-1 down to win 3-2. Town would not have their dream three vases in a row. A stunned town would have to wait another year. That is a story that not many people here know that after we got beaten by Barton Rovers in the bars, uh, we'd all had a good drink. We was back here probably about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and I was crying my eyes out because I thought that was it, that was my chance of Wembley gone. And Bony came up to me, pat me on the shoulder, he said, Youngy, I can assure you, I'll make sure you get there next season. And true to his word, we got there. The man was enormous. Great respect for him. Stevie Bone, Imperial, absolutely brilliant. So lucky to get him to come to this club. Fantastic character, fantastic player. The 1979 Vars run included four veterans of the 1976 final, all looking for a hat trick of gold medals Fred Clayden. Paul Scott, John Pullen and Steve Bone. New boy Jamie Reeves and an on-form young added ammunition to Town's firepower. Town got off to a shaky start with a gutsy 2-1 win at home against Raynham Town. The match saw Tony Wakefield score from the spot on 12 minutes and Raynham equalised on 99 minutes against a 10-man Town as Paul Blackaller was sent off 40 minutes from the end. Phil Wettel got a finger in the eye so Town played some of the match with only nine. Dougie Young got a winner in extra time. Epping Town were outclassed in front of 850 people conceding 5-0 to a rampant Billericay who could have had many more. 
Goals came from Phil Wettel, Jamie Reeves, Dougie Young and Fred Clayton got a couple, unlucky not to get his hat-trick. Royston Town were next up at home, Town winning 2-0. Doug Young took a knock to the head and was concussed, hobbling off at half-time. Town won 2-1 at Worthing away on a quagmire of mud with Reeves again and Young, who hadn't kicked a ball in three weeks whilst recuperating from the earlier head injury, netting the winner. Miriki overcame a gale, a sandy pitch and a gritty Eastbourne United away. The wind blew the length of the pitch and favoured each team in turn, Town taking full advantage in the first half after 25 minutes with a Billy Bingham solitary winner. I do remember it because uh, I remember the guy I was marking was, was was like a, a 10 second 100 metre guy and he was so, so fast. A couple of games I've been injured, I had a bad ankle so I missed a couple of games but um, no, it's, it's just touch and go wherever I play, fortunately I got over it. The semi-final against Shepshire Charterhouse saw a home win of 2-0 with Billy Bingham and Jamie Reeves both scoring in front of a noisy 2,223 crowd, an efficient victory on a bumpy pitch which saw many chances go begging. The second leg saw Charterhouse in a match full of fouls cancelling out Town's advantage with a 2-0 home win of their own, leaving the match at 2 all on aggregate. Cambridge City's ground hosted the much-anticipated replay with Freddie Clayton netting two goals on a near-perfect pitch in the tensest of matches. And so to the sound of ecstatic relieved travelling fans, Billericay were back at Wembley for the third time. Expectancy ran high. In 1979, Vars final would see Billericay play Armandsbury Greenway. Excitement was high amongst the players too. For one about to make his mark on history, it was a little too exciting. Surreal, basically. Uh, waking up, me and Paul Blackalla room together. Come down for breakfast and Colin Sell said, uh, I asked everyone if they slept well. And Freddie Klein and Paul Scott said no. So we had a couple of giggling school kids in the room next door. It's just me and Blackie just couldn't believe what was going on, going to Wembley. It's just amazing. The third year I actually said to the guys, the new guys that were playing there, you know, what to do, take it all in because we're never going to do this again. And as Dougie said earlier, um, that he went and had a look at all the, the different, the things that you wouldn't look at normally. They took it all in and, and they, were, they were so pleased that they did. Yeah, I didn't have a pair of boots at Wembley till about half past two. Um, obviously the other players had been there and knew what the ground was like. And you had to wear a long stud and the, my boots were just worn out. The toes had gone, the studs were worn down. So um, I had three or four of them working on my boots to put new studs in for me. And I just sat there and waved at everyone going to the game. I was quite lucky, really. Doug Young had a premonition for his first Wembley appearance, stating on record that he had netted many hat-tricks there in his dream. And now it just gives me time in which to give the teams this afternoon. Uh, for Kulariki Town, who are playing in red today because uh, the uh, colours clashed and therefore um, they are playing in red with Almondsbury Greenway playing in white. I just really remember, just really remember that there seemed to be um, a lot more of the third Wembley than there was in, in the other two. And I know that, you know, I know the attendance figures show that there was, but it just seemed more. I think there was much more... Um, much more atmosphere, much more noise, um, and it, it was a joy, absolute joy. Uh, the match, uh, do you want just the goals? Or, there's just so much in it. Everything, fortunately for me, worked well and for the team. We was amazing. We played some good football. We literally played them off the park. It was just a pleasure to play and to do it at Wembley was even more exceptional. 
Turkey got off to a good start with Fred Clayton setting up Doug Young on 11 minutes. Back again to number 11, Groom. Groom floats to 4 4. There's Henry Ford. There comes the ball. Henry, it's a goal! It's a goal! Well, the first goal was Dave Groom breaking down the left, knocked it to the far post. Freddie headed it back. I got in front of the keeper and knocked it in. I remember just running around like a headless chicken, jumping into Billy Bingham's arms, shouting our school at Wembley. That's what it meant. On 34 minutes, a well-rehearsed free-kick routine would give Fred Clayton a chance to get on the scoreboard. They seem to go one way, the O spot. was uh, a masterpiece, not typically because I scored it, but because it was a, a planned move that has been practiced many hours on the training ground, and it would be where it was Dougie on this occasion would go in, take the defenders that were marking him in there, then come back out and block the player that was marking me. I would then go into the empty space where Paul Scott had passed the ball into and it was a, an easy, an easy tapping. Second goal was a free kick we rehearsed every week and it worked so well, me running out of the way, Scotty knocked the ball in, Freddie and Freddie just clinical, just so pleasing. All that hard work to do it at Wembley. Oh, there's it! It's got to run, it's off the line! It's heading back there once again! That ball just would not go in for the third goal! Armandsbury got back in the match with a free kick that tested Paul Norris standing in for an injured Steve Griffiths. Uh, close up shops and really start uh, on the attack again. But I don't think there's any fear of that. Sport goes for. There's a long shot going for and yes, the goal came there. Oh yes, it is. It's a goal. On 69 minutes, Town gained a corner and Doug Young skillfully steered the ball over his shoulder to rapture in the stadium. Uh, the third goal, ultimately, Phil Wettel corner, Jamie Reeves. Headed it on and I just hit it on the volley over my shoulder in the corner. Right half, Bill Wettel to take this, number four on his back, nodded forward over his end, it's a the goal! Doug Young has scored his second goal! <laughs> Dougie Young's last goal, three minutes before time, lives in the memory for all that witnessed it. And then the fourth one was their corner. Billy Bingham broke it up, knocked it to Freddie. Freddie knocked it through to me. And I just hit it the first time on the outside of my right foot. Chipped the keeper from it's about 80 yards, I think it was. Or it is now, anyway. Cross over there, and it's Young chasing the ball. Has he got the seam there? He clips on forward. It's in the bar to go! It's a glorious goal by Young! It's his hat trick! He outpaced the full back there, he just gained that extra foot. He clipped the ball up in the air, the goalkeeper advanced, and there the ball just hit the underside of the crossbar. I can't really remember after the game, trying to look for my dad in the crowd. Uh, just joy, basic joy. Actually done it, won at Wembley. Just happy for everyone. The fans, the management, the players, everyone who was involved. It was just sheer joy. We actually played tremendous. And, and that was kind of relief as well because we'd been there twice before and not done ourselves justice. Um, but the last one, Dougie's hat trick. I actually scored as well. Um, and we were we were brilliant that day. Well, strangely enough, I I actually felt that uh, that I I wasn't in any of the photos or footage or anything else. But I've seen from the footage that I actually was, and I don't actually remember getting hold of the the cup either. Um, 
but in fact I did. 39 steps there are up to Wembley in them days to collect the trophy. I was up last, got me medal, and then I'm um, giving it the big one, waving it to everyone, and slipped over on the concrete steps. Captured on film, yeah, that was it, but yeah, Ron Green would have polite words to say. Said something back to him, it was, yeah, it's nice. And the trainers, the scouts, everybody down there are going on the field. And perhaps, uh, I think it only right and proper, well, you can describe who's on that field of play at the moment, Steve. I'll hand the microphone over to you because it's just as much your day up here with me on commentary today, which we are most grateful for. It's just as much your day as it is indeed for all those Twelve players down there and all the officials of the Billericay Town Football Club. As always, Doug, it's a, it's a complete team performance at Billericay. The manager, Colin Searle, assistant manager, Arthur Coughlin, John Clark, his assistant, Harry Lesley, the general manager, they're all out there congratulating the lads and the lads congratulating them as well. Was there a party afterwards? There's a party still going on now, I think. It was, uh, yeah, a few bottles of beer, everything. It just didn't stop all the way back. Carried on through the night. Got to do it once in a lifetime thing. Other players fortunate to do it three times, but you know it's yeah. We were quite good at celebrating. We never got tired of that, and uh, if anything, we got better. We certainly had some champagne, that's for sure, and we certainly parted. We had a lot of practice. There was a lot to celebrate over the years that I particularly played here and everybody enjoyed each other's company and even I, from the first early days till when I left the, the atmosphere amongst the players was brilliant it was second to none that everybody loved being with each other and there was no there was no jealousies with anybody anybody everybody just loved each other and loved each other to do well the open top bus journeys through the high street were memorable to say the least they actually started from humble beginnings in 1969 our last game was in the Olympian League, was against a team called Burnham Ramblers. We decided that we would go from the ground and we would go in this open top bus to Burnham Ramblers. We, we had to win it to win the league and we won 2 0, I think it was. So we came back. We got to the clubhouse and we said, let's go through the town. So we came out of the club, went up Western Road in this open top bus and there's all 12 players up there shouting and screaming. Nobody had a clue what we were screaming about. We got up to the lights turned right of the lights, we went up the high street, again, everyone was looking but didn't know why we was all shouting. We ended up in the Rising Sun, which was on the corner, and we went in there and celebrated. Now, compare that with when we got on the bus in 1976, few years later, we went up Western Road, we turned right at the lights and we could not see High Street. It was a mass of people. And we all looked at each other and said, this is mass. And I, I thought back to the days 
six, seven years earlier when there was nobody there. And there, we could not see the high street. It was just a mass of people. I think it, it was a. I think it was a surprise to all of us, just how many people turned up on that that Sunday morning um, to uh, you know to cheer uh, to cheer the team. Uh, I, I can remember being on top of the bus, uh, looking back, and there were crowds as far as you could see. Uh, we were on the bus, and I was being interviewed by Doug Renfrey for a tape he was doing and for Basil in the hospitals. As we turn left out of the club there's a big tree hanging over it on the back of the head. So that was a good start on the way round but other than that, High Street all the way up, people, fantastic. The number of people out in the streets was fantastic. Yeah, that had never been forgotten. There's a few special keepsakes amongst the players to this day. In the souvenirs, um, everybody was prepared to give you this, give you this. There's, yeah, there's a little bag there, uh, which my dear wife managed to find from upstairs. Grandchildren don't stop looking at them. I don't look at them then because I was a lot younger. So uh, got the three medals that I picked up. Um, my son has got one and my daughter's got one and uh, there's one at home. I have one of them. My, my two sons have the others and it's only a, a few years from now that I'll be giving in my one to my grandson and that will be it and they can uh, treasure them and have something to remember me by. I got my shirt, shorts, I gave my socks to Ricky McQueen. I still got the top, warm up top we wore at Wembley. I put it on the other day, it still fits, which is the summer. That's the only thing that's fit about me now. But um, I've got a couple of rosettes, and there's a banner that uh, a couple of our supporters had that said uh, Doug drops them in the net quicker than Sammy Nelson because he scored for Arsenal, then dropped his shorts down to the photographer. So it was in the shape of a pair of shorts, I still got that. The three, the three Wembley medals um, in, a, in a frame. Um, I've still got the shirt from, from the final, and I think I've got the three programmes. But that's about it, I'm not one for souvenirs. Uh, where was the match ball? Who knows? No idea where it went. Um, I was given a ball after the game and Stevie Bones said that you know, the club normally has the ball. So I gave it to the club and it just disappeared. The hard fought battles as a team, the unique social side of the club and ultimately the Vars victories has bonded the players to this day. It's unlike any other club. So what do you think of the Billericay fans? We interacted with them all, certainly a certain uh, number, because they were with us all the time, uh, backing us. Uh, they were on the coach, some of them. They have a real, uh, I've got to say, head cases, funny, and, and they, they motivated you. Um, and still to this day, there's several of them still around, which is lovely. 
uh, and they were sort of uh, as much as legends as us really. Uh, yeah, they were just uh, um, just phenomenal people. I think the fans that were around at that time um, were another dimension to the to the team. Um, the fans were as important as, as the team was. Um, a lot of them became became personal friends. Um, some of them we still see even now, um, after all this time. And I think at the time there were there was a lot of social interaction between the team uh, and the fans. And it's that's something that you don't really see too much at other other football clubs. Um, certainly not these days, and probably certainly not then either. Uh, and I think that was one of the big advantages that we had over over other clubs that you could almost you could almost consider the the fans were worth were worth a goal to us now and again when you know when things maybe not going our way, the fans would try and lift us. I, I didn't consider them as fans, to be honest. Um, they were just part of the, the wave of our success. to drink with us, they used to have jokes with us, and, and they were just part of us. So they, they weren't fans, they were family. You know, I, I, I can't say enough for them, because they kept us, obviously, you, you know, you can't do it on your own out there. Um, the crowd were, were phenomenal people. They weren't football fans, they were people to us. I just felt that um, I'd achieved something in life, and particularly as it was attached to Billericay Town, because I felt part of the community here. And, the, you know, someone said earlier on about it, but they weren't fans, they were family. So it's absolutely true. I'm still treated very, very um, flatteringly whenever I do, uh, come here to this club. I get treated in, in an extraordinarily charming way. Amazing, immense. Just all the way through my career that I had here and coming back and supporting, still seeing people like Ron and Joyce Signs, Derek Hanks, people like loads of people were involved with the club before I came here. Even the supporters now, it's, it's just brilliant. This club's always been that way. Always back you 100%. If it's not going right, they'll always still be there. Just tremendous. What's your most prized memory from playing at Billericay? That's a tough one, I think. We've had some really brilliant times at this club and the, it's sort of depicted by the way the fans hang around and they, they, they mix with the players and it feels like one big family. And I'm a part of it and I just feel that I could sort of not be here for 10 years and come back and the fans would still be treating you just like you, you like a local hero. I, I sort of feel, I feel like that when I'm here. I do, it's true. Well, we were the two Vars finals. Um, you know, we, we we did very well as a team at Billericay. We didn't lose many. Um, and uh, yeah, the Vars, the Vars has got to be in the, the top. Well, without, without a doubt, were, was the Vars finals. Um, and probably of the Vars finals was the last one. Uh, prize memory. Well, I, I, I've got so, so many memories of this club that, that there's no there's not one even the Wembley games don't stand out 
as a, as a special memory. I just had so many friends here. And, and, and to be able to play for a, a side like Billericay Town was a pleasure, was an honour. Everything, all of it. I remember games and how they went and things like that, people in the crowd. It was just everything about this club. It's a memory that will never leave. Because Billerick is ingrained in you. You spoke to Jeff, John, you're going to speak to Freddie, Arthur, John. They're just everything about them. This club, it means a lot. So, in a hundred years time, how would you want to be remembered? Uh, I hope there'll be uh, enough of my um, family to uh, keep the memory going and perhaps they might come back and, um, and see what sort of the legacy was that we left here. Fantastic. Quite amazing. I'm still very flattered by it all. As you can tell. No. Just as a Billericay player, as successful as the team were, and be, just being part of that team. Um, it was a great team, but, uh, and you can't forget that. As I say, you, you'll forget the little games. You I couldn't even remember how we got on against other teams like Morgan and Pitsy and other teams. But you'll never forget uh, the great matches, which were obviously the finals. And all the boys associated with you. Simple as that. Hundred years from now, if I was if I was remembered as a as a nice person, a fairly decent player, I'd be happy with that. Um, just part of part of the history of this great club, because you know, and hopefully, people will remember these days in a hundred years' time, and will have because of social media, we'll have the names that they can look at. A hundred years ago, I don't know who was playing for Billericay. But hopefully a hundred years now, they'll say, oh, oh, Freddie Clayton. That, that's all, that's all. For being me, um, other than that, just to be part of it. This club has always been a team. It's never been about one individual. The team is immense. That is, that is it. It's Billericay, not an individual.